Hey the YouTube is Abdul Parag here with another reaction video. Today we got Racing's most bizarre accident by EMP Lemon. Let's get right into it, shall we? Hit it. The invention of the automobile predates the invention of the airplane by just 17 yeah. years, which many may find surprising. Mm -hmm. After all, driving is far more simple than flying, so it stands to reason that we should have figured out one long before the other. Intuitively. But as it turns out, these two things have always been a lot closer than you'd expect. Officially, hmm. the first motor vehicle was patented by Carl Benz in 1886. It sold for the equivalent of $5,000 and at a top speed of 10 miles per hour. This humble contraption would usher in the automotive world we know today. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we had cars, it was only a matter of time before we started racing them. Oh. One of the pioneers of motorsport was a man by the name of Wilhelm Bauer, who would test drive vehicles for a German Daimler automaker, motor DMG. On March 30th, 1900, Bauer was slated to race the company's new Phoenix model at the Turby Hill Climb in France. However, in the first corner, he lost control and suffered a fatal accident. Mm. By most accounts, Wilhelm Bauer had become the very first death in motorsports. <laughs> it would be the last time the Phoenix ever raced. Okay. However, out of the ashes of the tragedy, DMG executive Emil Jelinek would improve upon his initial design. Over the next few months, he oversaw the development of a revolutionary new model. Unlike the horseless carriages that preceded it, this vehicle would be the first to truly resemble the cars of today. During the production process, Jelinek decided to title the model after his 11-year-old daughter. As fate would have it, this unsuspecting girl would forever be intertwined with the longest-running car brand in the world. Her name was Mercedes. In the fall... You know, like, you know, you know, people get flack for like, you know, nowadays, for, you know, naming their daughters Mercedes, and then you realize there actually was a girl named Mercedes, and the brand is named after her. It's like, oh shit, okay. Wow. Following years, I did the not new know model that. would dazzle the automotive wow. industry, becoming popular with many of the most powerful people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Its meteoric success would turn DMG into a commercial juggernaut. In 1926, they would merge with Carl Benz's yeah. company to solidify the present-day nomenclature of Mercedes-Benz. Mm. By this point, the temperament of Germany had changed considerably. The car brand, which had originally shared its name with a Jewish child, would soon become the favorite of one Adolf Hitler. By the Second World War, Mercedes had to momentarily divert their resources away from car production, as their focus shifted from the road to the skies. Huh. Daimler-Benz would be one of several companies commissioned by the Third Reich to construct engines for German fighter jets. Oh. Mercedes' horsepower would be instrumental in the Blitzkrieg, which terrorized Europe for more than half a decade. Hmm. All of a sudden, what was once a simple luxury car brand had fallen into an insidious fate. That's, that, that is fascinating to me. Like, I mean, uh, look, I, I guess the engineering principle behind it would not be that different because I get it. But you imagine designing a car would be different from designing an airplane. But I understand the context here is they're not designing an airplane. They only have to design the engine for the airplane. So in theory, yeah, yeah, one rotor that basically, you know, has one output that's basically for the fr uh, front propeller and that's it yeah but then you also have to you know design it for airflow like i can imagine the complexity of designing an airplane engine while already designing like car engines and then trying to imagine well it shouldn't be that much of a stretch that since one is so closely related to the other that the engineering for both of them are very similar i don't think so but i i would imagine that they may have had ex like external expertise to help them build those engines i think to satisfy the enormous Because I feel like that jump between the car engine to the airplane engine was not as quick as, oh, let's just use the same engineers. I think they probably had better help, I think. ...of wartime production. Yeah. The company would resort to using forced labor, much of which came directly from concentration yep. camps. When it was all said and done, the rest of the world had discovered a powerful omen. When Mercedes start flying, it's usually a sign that something has gone seriously wrong. Officially, the Germans surrendered in the May of When a Mercedes starts flying, something has gone horribly wrong. If I think where he's going with this, I can... You know what? Yeah. Of 1945. Let's keep going. However, in many aspects, the war never really ended. It had simply moved to a new battleground. Hmm. 
By the 1950s, the Germans and English had taken the fight to the racetrack, okay. and out of all the venues in motorsports, none was more prestigious than Le Mans. It still is today. Since the birth of auto yeah. racing, France's premier endurance event has stood as the ultimate test of man and machine. For 24 hours, competitors must navigate the high-speed circuit, a process made especially challenging by the three-mile-long Molsan Strait. The section is one of the fastest parts of any course in the world. Yeah. Ordinarily a public highway, the road surface is bumpy and abrasive, Ooh. placing tremendous strain on engines as vehicles approach their top speed. In order to win at Le Mans, race teams must strike a delicate balance between performance and longevity. This hmm. unique test of engineering skill would attract the industry's top manufacturers. By the 1950s, Mercedes had established itself as one of the teams to beat with their iconic Silver Arrow. Hmm. They spent the early part of the decade trading wins with Jaguar and Ferrari, who had entered into an automotive arms race. By 1955, the rivalry would reach its breaking Because I imagine, I, I imagine it's all about the prestige of winning the race. It's kind of like, you know, telling people that we have the best car. That's quite literally it. I think nowadays, I'm not really sure if the message is the same with F1 right now. It, it really is kind of like a, you know... As, as an advertisement piece more than anything else like here's the brand here's what we're capable of but i'm not sure if that dna or i mean yeah sure the dna is preserved to this day but i think what it stands for has changed like substantially at least through the years for sure years of rapid innovation had contributed to higher top speeds mm -hmm. than ever before mm -hmm. beyond what the existing infrastructure was designed to support mm -hmm. An hour into the race, Jaguar driver Mike Hawthorne set the lap record for the circuit. Ooh. Just moments later, he would instigate the biggest disaster in racing history. No, 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 no. Okay. On the 35th lap, Hawthorne slowed abruptly to begin his pit cycle, forcing Austin Healey driver Lance oh. Macklin to swerve around him. In the commotion, Mercedes driver Pierre Levey collided with Macklin launching his vehicle airborne at over 120 miles per hour, directly <laughs> into the crowd. Oh. And just like that, a Mercedes was flying again. <laughs> Bro, you diabolical for this. In 1955, Ooh. there was no fence protecting the grandstands at Le Mans. Yep. Debris from LeVay's disintegrating car blasted the spectators at full yep. force. In the blink of an eye, more than 80 people had perished. Yeah. The world of motorsports okay. had arrived at its Armageddon, yep. and Mercedes found itself at ground zero. Yep. Unbelievably, the race was not stopped. What? Huh? Excuse me? What? What did you just say? At ground zero. Unbelievably, the race was not stopped. How? Crews gradually cleaned up the track as drivers continued to blow past at full speed. By now, LeVay's demolished car had burst into flames. The fire department was unable to extinguish the magnesium chassis, right. which just sat there, burning for hours. Lap after lap, Mercedes' remaining entry had to drive past the hellish remains of its mirror image. No, 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 no. Bro, bro, you cannot make this up. That is fucked up, okay? I am sorry. What do you mean they just kept a burning car on the edge while everyone drove past, including your partner and teammate, who knows you're dead, sees the burning car and says, oh yeah, that, that might be me for real. Bro, this is insane. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. This is, um, bro, back then it was, bro, that, that was wild. Those were wild days, for sure. Magnesium chassis as well. Who would have thought that's a bright idea? Flammable as... I mean, hey, look, man, I, I, it's what they say for safety, you know, like, uh, rules and safety. It's like your, um, like, uh, safety manual and stuff like that, especially when you get on a plane or, you know, when you go on a racetrack. The, most of those rules are often written in blood because people don't care about those rules until people actually suffer and die without, or, you know, due to the lack of them, basically. So, the fact that this race continued is... I don't know, man. That, that is... I can't process that. I can't wrap my, my mind around It's hard that. to say Jeez. when exactly Europe moved on from the Second World War, but it was clear at this point that Germany's greatest manufacturers still had some sort of cosmic debt to pay. Yeah. As night fell, Mercedes had taken the lead, mm -hmm. and the gruesome details of the tragedy began to emerge. Yeah. 
After hours of witnessing the same unnerving display, the team had seen enough. When the clock struck midnight, the race director decided not to tempt fate any further. Mercedes withdrew from the race, wow. just 12 hours from victory. The decision effectively handed the win to Jaguar, huh. as Mike Hawthorne, the driver who started this whole chain of events, hoisted the trophy the next afternoon. The aftermath that followed would not be so joyous. Yeah. The tragedy prompted an immediate ban on motorsports across most of Europe, some of which remained in place until just two years ago. Wow. Wow. Jesus. First of all, the fact that you could have a race end, hand the winner over to second place, who was the cause of that accident in the first place, and no one said anything is my understanding here. No one challenged it. I... I got nothing to say, bro. I got nothing to say. The fact I didn't really know Switzerland was against racing till 2022. I did not know this. I could have sworn there were. <sighs> Maybe it's just me, but I always didn't to think this that day, was. A thing. Auto racing hmm. has never seen another disaster like. Yeah, Follow very good. You, th thank you. That is good. <laughs> During months of government investigation, hmm. no one in particular could be found at fault, hoping to appease whatever what, vengeful- What do you mean no one was found at fault? Who? He- he slowed down the car, the tur- uh, yeah, okay. ...full spirit they had angered, Mercedes would not return to Le Mans for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And as for Mike Hawthorne, the curse of that dark day would eventually catch up to him. Just four years later, oh. he was fatally injured in a road accident losing control of his Jaguar while attempting to pass a Mercedes. No, 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 no. control of his Jaguar while attempting to pass... Hawthorne had overtaken his Mercedes with a wave and a charming smile a few seconds before his death. Look, man, I... I'm conflicted here. I don't know if he's a good dude or a douche. I really don't know. But for what it's worth, the hands of fate are unisex. They don't care. They come for everyone equally... As long as there's karma to be dished out. And uh, his karma was indeed there to be dished out. And uh, he was indeed dished out. Let's keep going. As a Mercedes. As the years went on, racing eventually returned. Le Mans received some much needed safety improvements. Good and call. the cars that raced there went from looking like this to this. Mm. As our understanding of aerodynamics improved, mm -hmm. the speeds crept higher and higher. Mm -hmm. All the while, Mercedes watched from the sidelines. <laughs> they saw numerous <laughs> racing dynasties come yeah, and go. Just say, just say, uh, the way he Mercedes said it. Mercedes watched from the sidelines. You know that meme of like, you know, Squidward looking down and like Patrick and SpongeBob just running? I'm just, just the image in my mind of how Mer Mercedes is just looking, just like, oh, you having fun over there? <laughs> They saw numerous racing dynasties come and wow. go, from Ferrari to Ford to the most dominant of all, Porsche. Yeah. Maybe it was all that glory from a national rival that enticed them to get back into no, the if fight. If I'm not wrong, isn't Porsche trying to get back, uh, get into F1? I think recently there were news about that as well. Right. Maybe it was a new generation of leadership yeah. who had forgotten the superstition of the Good. past. Either way, Mercedes decided the time had come to return to Le Mans. They just couldn't stay away. This time, however, they didn't go in alone. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, well, they actually, they, they didn't hide it. They actually did say like in the newspaper, yeah, this is the reason why they left and uh, they want to come back. All right, okay, wow. And stay away. Respect. This time, Fair however, enough. they didn't go in alone. Before committing to a full factory team, they would have to completely rebuild their in-house racing program. Oh. In the meantime, they partnered with Swiss constructor Sauber, who would compete under the Mercedes banner. Sauber is their Swiss? Why did I think they were... Huh. New model, the C8, was the, set to make the, its... I'm sorry, like there's so many things I'm learning from this that I didn't know about that just like, oh shit, that makes sense actually. Huh. Compete under the Mercedes banner. Their new model, the C8, was set to make its I gallant know this is debut going. at the 1985 yeah. running of Le Mans. Unfortunately, the new program got off to a rather inauspicious start. Mm -hmm. yeah. Schlag's wife. Okay, yeah, yeah. 30 years later and nothing had changed. Mm -hmm. 
The moment Mercedes returned to Le Mans, they were once again sent airborne. <sighs> Although this time, the circumstances of the incident were quite different. Okay. The front end gets light, and over 140, then wants to lift off and fly to Hawaii. Ooh. By the 1980s, race cars were beginning to <laughs> reach like unthinkable away. speeds, yeah. largely due to innovations in controlling downforce. Yeah. As a car cuts through the air, the body can be sculpted in a way so that the resulting pressure sticks the car to the right. racing surface, increasing grip. Yeah. However, at certain unstable orientations, downforce can be overpowered mm. by lift, yeah. sending the car upward. Mm. Under the most extreme speeds, such as the ones at the end of the Mulsan Strait, yeah. drivers were becoming increasingly susceptible to taking yeah. off. For Mercedes, this new incident of terror certainly didn't bode well for their racing return. It's a simple force balance, right? There's the force that wants to lift you up from the air, and it's the down force that your car is trying to push down onto the ground. And it's, it's kind of that constant balance, because you need to balance it properly. Because you put too much down force, you aren't... Ah, it's a weird balance of speed. You have too much downforce, you aren't gonna get much faster, but you have too less downforce, you're gonna flip up. It's kind of on that knife edge of having just enough downforce to stay on the track and having grip, while not having too much to slow you down either, I think. But they were able yeah. to come out of it mostly unscathed. Driver John Nielsen walked away from the wreck in one piece, Good. and since it occurred during a practice session, it was hardly documented. Despite the rude awakening, Mercedes would carry on. That's good. Starting in 1987, the team would debut the new and improved Sauber C9. Mm -hmm. Despite showing promising lap times, the model struggled to stay on track. Four years mm -hmm. into their Le Mans return, Mercedes had failed to finish a single race. Wow. But their fortunes would turn around after the return of a familiar foe. Mm -hmm. In 1988, Jaguar was victorious at Le Mans for the first time in 30 years. Okay. Perhaps this was the inspiration Mercedes needed to finally get their mojo back, because in 1989, the Silver Arrow re-emerged as the class of the field. On that day, Mercedes was unbeatable. Oh. In fact, the cars were so quick that they ushered in the end of an era. During qualifying, the Sauber C9 went just shy of 250 miles Jeez. per hour on the Mulsanne Strait. Okay. Fearing another catastrophe, the race directors determined that they had to get the speeds under control. Huh? And so, starting in 1990, a pair of chicanes were installed to interrupt the fastest part of the track. Okay. Following the layout change, Mercedes lost all of its competitive edge. Just as they had finally hit their stride, wow. they were sent back to the drawing board. Wow. After several more years of lackluster performance, they withdrew from Le Mans once again to focus on other racing endeavors. Yeah, F1. This time, yeah. however, they wouldn't be gone for long. After finding success in the FIA GT Championship, yeah. Mercedes decided to give it one more shot. With the millennium <clears throat> soon approaching, the manufacturer was closing in on their 100th year of racing. Ooh. And what better way to celebrate than by capping off the century with a victory at Le Mans? Hmm. By now, Mercedes were finally ready to feel the genuine factory team, so that the glory would be all theirs. Hmm. Their first race back in 1998, they looked as if they hadn't skipped a beat by qualifying on pole. No. The triumph was short-lived, however, as both entries would retire from the race due to mechanical Jeez, issues. Yeah. But no matter, the cars had already proven it, it's, you know, It actually is insane if you look back and really think about it, because Porsche has been so dominant that it's not often like a topic of discussion, but they are oof, great Ask engineers. Me. With a few tweaks, they should be able to stay on track and cruise to victory. Mm. The jinx on that, isn't it? In 1999, Mercedes returned to Le Mans with their pinnacle of engineering, the CLR, a machine that represented a hundred years of innovation. Okay. The car had an unmistakable look, its most iconic feature being the familiar Mercedes stylization on the front end. Yeah. Throughout the company's history at Le Mans, no other entry had undergone more extensive preparation. After 20,000 miles of testing, no major problems could be found. By all accounts, everything was coming together for the last hurrah mm -hmm. of the Silver Arrow. Mm -hmm. Entering the race weekend, Mercedes unveiled their holy I remember trinity, this. three CLRs and three opportunities at making history. Mm -hmm. Over the next few days, the team would certainly rise to the occasion. Just hey, no, 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 no. the puns there were, un uh, bro, they're obnoxious. <laughs> it's like, oh, they'll rise to the occasion, all right. Oh, they will definitely rise. 
<laughs> the way sure. they had envisioned. Mm -hmm. This one is iconic. Okay. The first sign of trouble appeared during qualifying, when the number four entry wound up totaled on the Indianapolis Strait. Okay. Driver Mark Weber was hospitalized, where he was treated for minor injuries. As reports of the accident emerged, it was revealed that Mercedes had once again gone airborne. Since the wreck occurred at an unpopulated part of the track, no footage was captured. Oh. For the time being, the reason for the mishap could not be determined. Was it just a freak accident, or possibly something more? Despite the ominous turn if of If your car is known to have a weird lifting problem that's already, you know, appeared at least once in its history, you might be in your best interest to kind of look at your design and engineering team and basically tell them, yeah, whatever you do, give it just a bit more downforce. It's okay being slower as long as our car stays on the track would be my safe understanding of what that engineering principle or practice should have been. We're going to see if they did that. Hence, Mercedes would not be discouraged. Later in the day, they announced that they would not only remain in the race, but that the number four CLR would be rebuilt in time for the main event I on Saturday. I did not Saturday. know that. Okay, wow. Less than 48 hours after checking out of the hospital, Mark Webber was back behind the bro, wheel. that is crazy, bro. I mean, I, I will say this for what it's worth. Race car drivers, at least from the Mons and F1, they're a different breed. Like, you see their neck... I mean, in the F1, you see the neck training they have. It's basically like, if you... If you haven't sat in, a, you know, in an F1 car and you try pulling up those Gs, you cannot move your head. And the fact they lose so much water, like at least in F1, they lose so much water, they lose a lot of their body weight. And then on top of that, you got, uh, you, you're driving for 24 hours. I mean, yeah, they got different drivers shifting in and out. But at night? Uh, God damn, bro. This is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a ruthless, it's a ruthless uh, sport for sure. The team had worked around the clock to get the car ready just in time for the final practice session on Saturday morning. When the trio reunited on track, they nice. must have been feeling pretty inspired. Yeah. Until it happened again. Oh, hello. Oh, nice. You know it's a thing of science to come when it's like you're pushing karma, you're pushing fate, you're pushing things that you should not be pushing, and you know it's giving you hints. Look, I'm about to do something so diabolical. I'm giving you advice. Leave the track while you still can. And you still don't take the advice. It's got a car on its roof already. How on earth has this happened? This is wait, wait, what do you mean? How on earth has this happened? Have you not seen the history that we've? I mean, yeah, they might. They might not know. Fair enough. They might not know. Oh, hello, oh it's got a car on its roof already. How on earth has this happened? This is amazing. This happened in the qualifying sessions. This car flipped over in qualifying, and it looks as though exactly the same thing has happened again. How on earth? If it wasn't already. Mercedes' little problem had now become known to the rest of the world, right? as television cameras caught a live view of Weber's car lying on its yeah. roof at the end of the Mulsanne You couldn't hide that. The number four CLR had taken off for a second well, it's time. It's the same car! It was now clear that the first accident was no fluke. Okay. There was a fundamental flaw with the aerodynamics yeah. of the CLR. Yeah. As it turns out, the defect could be traced back to the car's oh-so-stylish front end. Yeah. The nose of the vehicle was designed abnormally long. Yeah. This excessive overhang allowed more leverage for the more air lift, to generate like a wing. lift. Under extreme turbulence, such as entering the slipstream of another car, the balance of the CLR could be disrupted enough to send yeah. the whole thing flying. Where your force of lift overpowers your downforce, and then you are, poof, you are up to the moon. Now, just a few hours until the green flag, Mercedes was in a state of pandemonium. With Weber's car destroyed once again, only two entries could continue to the okay. race. But would it even make sense to let them? The machines were clearly hazardous, but could they really let an entire year of effort go to waste? Perhaps the contagion was limited to the four car, and the other two had nothing to worry I about. I think I can see that's a reasonable intuition, though. It's like only the number four car had this problem. It's possible that, you know, it, could, it might not be the other two cars. But let me be clear, they're all designed to be identical. They're all designed to the exact same specification. It's very unlikely, I don't think, that only one had that flaw. I'm sure. Despite being manufactured to the same specification. Well, oh, thank you. It, yes. Yes, <laughs> quite, quite literally. Ultimately, the decision came down to the drivers. 
While Christoph Bushi expressed concerns about the number 5 car, he was overruled by the others. Wow. After all, it's a dream to race at Le Mans. But the thing about dreams is that no one is ever prepared when they turn into a nightmare. Oh, that is a beautiful quote. Uh, the thing about dreams is no one's ever prepared when it actually turns into a nightmare. That's a good quote. There, there's enough instances in life that I can yeah, I can think of that's, that that quote that quote is applicable for. God. The thing about dreams is that no one is ever prepared when they turn into a nightmare. After some emergency modifications to increase downforce, the remaining CLRs rolled off the grid. As the afternoon those went modifications on, it was cautiously smooth sailing for the Mercedes. Oh, Bush Bush's concerns appeared to be assuaged as he made it to the first driver swap without incident. Replacing him in the okay, five so was Peter Dumbrick, okay. who would carry on into the evening. As dusk began to fall, Dumbrick had worked his way up to a battle for second with one of the Toyotas. Yes. When the pair entered the Indianapolis Strait, they turned to face the setting sun. With the drivers momentarily blinded, the Mercedes drew ever so close to the back of the Toyota. The rest, as they say, is history. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen this video. Like, just of, of what happens is just as well. Yeah, there's, a, there's a saying, like, you know, exit stage left. Some people yeah. only watch racing for the accidents. And while they're often chastised by the rest of the motorsports community for missing the point, I sort of understand the appeal. While it's easy to write off this side of racing as mindless carnage, there is something spectacular about it that speaks to us on a deeper level. In sports, there are plenty of stories about glory, but the wisest lessons are often taught by catastrophic failure. He's right. In order to truly appreciate something for its greatness, you have to witness it at its most dysfunctional. Yes. In these rare moments, the accidents tell us more than the racing ever could. Oh! oh! It has gone again! Oh, oh, there it is! It's into the trees! That is the end of Mercedes Benz. That is... Obviously the wrong decision to actually race. Yeah, but I think he still survived if I'm not wrong. I've seen this, I've seen the accident. It's it's infamous, but I don't know much more about that. Yeah, our future plans still are me on the No way. Whoa, I did not know that. So they had the accident immediately. No, back up boys, we out. And they left. Bro, that is... <laughs> that is such a Mercedes thing to do as well. They have not returned to Le Mans since. That is beautiful. I, I knew, like, you know, obviously you've seen the accident footage, but I didn't really know most of the story you know, preceding it and the story that immediately after that they just left and never came back. <laughs> it's just hilarious to me. But uh, yeah, that's racing's most bizarre accident. I'd say the most infamous. Uh, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like, comment, subscribe, and uh, catch a bit of a in the next one. Peace. Take care. Noise.